play to you? No, I need to get to my question. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, Attorney General, you had a very moving statement about your grandparents coming here uh, from Belarus to live in the country without fear of prosecution. I grew up in a very similar country, Ukraine now, and when I came here as a young person, I believed in the value as an American not to be afraid of my government. But I wanted to tell you, and I want to share with you and get your thoughts on that. Are you aware that a lot of Americans are now uh, afraid of being prosecuted by your department? Are you aware about that? Are you aware of that? I'm just saying, are you aware or not? Uh, I think that uh, constant attacks on the department and saying no, it's that... It's not attacks. Well, let me, let me give you an example. I don't know we talk what... about January 6th. People. I'm sorry? Here, there, there are some people came on January 6th. There are probably were some people that came on January 6th here, you know, that had bad intent. But a lot of good Americans from my district came here because they are sick and tired of this government not serving them. They came with strollers and the kids, and there was chaotic situation because the proper security wasn't provided. That's a question that was answered really why. Why we debated for 45 minutes on the floor and didn't stop the debate after the people broke in into the Capitol. But these people came, they were throwing the smoke bombs into the crowd with strollers with kids. People were showed up, you know, FBI agent to people's houses. You had in my district, in my town, FBI phone numbers all over the district. Please call. Call that. People are truly afraid. I just want to make sure if you're not aware that you are. And this is a big problem when people are afraid of their own government. And I'll share some other things. We're talking about justice system. I don't question. You're probably not a bad person. I don't know you. But well, I'll tell you, you're in charge of the department. And people right now feel, you know, I look at Durham report and I call on the FISA violations of queries of millions of Americans, right? It's like KGB, but when I read Durham reports, we have this, you have a nice, you know, playbook. First, let's have a special counsel, and then you don't have to answer any questions here. Then, let's extend slow walk investigation on Hillary Clinton, on Hunter, Everything is slow walked. We were very quick on Donald Trump, but you were very slow walked. Then, by the time you know that investigation ended, statute of limitation expired, and all of your agents need to be tested for amnesia. No one recalls anything. Okay, you probably should have as part of your hiring policy. So no one held accountable, which was egregious what happened, you know, in that report. When I read about them, I can't believe it happened in the United States of America. This is my frustration, I'll be honest with you. Then, it's very interesting, you know, regardless what it is, even people in Obama administration raise concerns. You know, how can President Sanz be serving on, you know, corrupt Ukrainian oligarchs? Do you understand that it actually can undermine the war in Ukrainian effort and policy? I think these concerns were raised. The Obama administration didn't do anything about it. These people are dying right now, and Americans don't trust this president. So you, I want to ask you one thing. You know, as you, you know, I don't need answer because I know you're not going to, but I think you're probably a good American and you care. And a lot of these people are so afraid they cover up this stuff, I think, in your department because they're embarrassed that what we became as a country to say that what our Department of Justice became. That allows Russians to do propaganda in Chinese. It allows them to destabilize our country. That is danger to our republic. It is significant danger. And I have just one more question from you. You know, I mean, I agree on corporate crimes and FISA stuff, even with Democrats, that we need to do a better job. One more question for you. Do you believe that, you know, you talk about rights to vote, but do you believe that only U.S. citizens should be voting in this election and doing anything to make sure that only eligible people vote in elections? Yes and yes. Okay, I would like to see that, what you do. Thank you. Yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Vermont is recognized for her five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, General Garland, thanks so much for being here today. I know it's been a long day for you. Now, I'm relatively new to the committee, and I'm still getting my feet under me, uh, but as far as I can tell, what we are doing here today is talking about a lot of conspiracy theories, 
and it's frustrating and tedious for those of us in the committee, but I can tell you it is absolutely maddening for uh, my constituents back home in Vermont. We have so much important work to do to keep the government open. We're days away from a shutdown, and I just want to remind folks that we're in this situation because my colleagues across the aisle are reneging on a deal that a majority of their conference made along with their speaker. That's why we are in this situation. If they are successful in shutting down the government, seniors who rely on Social Security benefits will be impacted, thousands of Medicare recipients and applicants will be impacted, service members will stop receiving paychecks, veteran services will be curtailed. Those are the grim consequences from Republicans' inability and unwillingness to govern. I needed to start with that. Let's do some level setting here. Now, let's get to the real work of the DOJ and how Congress can help uh, the agency better serve its mission. Gun violence continues to plague our nation. We see the wreckage every day uh, on, on our television sets, on our computers, and in our, our communities. As a member of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, this issue is incredibly important to me and so many of my constituents. Now, I believe there's actual room for bipartisan congressional action on gun violence, uh, at least in some areas. Um, one of those areas, red flag laws. It's a great place to start. Vermont is one of 21 states uh, that was able to, to pass red flag laws. These laws are working to keep guns out of the hands of people who are in crisis. And yet, many states did not even apply for funding from the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act uh, to better implement red flag laws and to raise awareness about the program. In June 2021, DOJ published model legislation to help states craft their own extreme risk protection order. Now, Republicans continue to make unfounded accusations that these laws violate civil rights by taking guns away from Americans without any due process. Can you explain the due process protections that are put into place in the model legislation that DOJ pr proposed? Yes, and I would start by saying, of course, there's room for bipartisan agreement, and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is a very good example. Um, and that includes um, the ability to have funding for states that want to craft and put into place um, red flag laws. The requirement is that the red flag law um, um, include uh, due process protections. So I'm not, I don't know every element of the model uh, legislation, but the general idea is um, the um, uh, relatives or uh, friends of the person have to go to a court um, and get some kind of adjudication that the person is a danger to themselves uh, or to others. This normally relates to mental illness problems. It may relate to some others. Um, and, um, and so if a gun is taken away under those circumstances, there is then a right to uh, appeal, uh, to have a full hearing, um, um, in order to adjudicate uh, the question. Uh, that's the I, don't, I can't say I know every technicality, but I think that's about it. No, I appreciate that. And it's especially important to states like mine, rural states that have real issues with the, the silent killers, domestic violence, and also suicide. And so these are um, instances in which red flag laws can really make a difference. Uh, shifting gears here, um, I, along with Senator Warren and 20 of our colleagues, recently submitted a comment letter applauding the draft merger guidelines and urging agencies to finalize them. Corporate concentration remains a pressing problem for the U.S. economy, and I fear that we are falling behind in this area and American consumers continue to feel the pain because of this. With the introduction of the draft merger guidelines, how does the department plan to ensure that future mergers and acquisitions do not stifle competition or harm consumers? Because that's often the pushback that we get. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the intention of the merger guidelines um, is to set forth the enforcement policy of the department. Um, they, the, the different generations of, of the guidelines, which I hate to say it, go all the way back to the time when I was in law school, um, have been adopted and, uh, and or been uh, um, helpful to uh, generations of judges. Um, I sat on at least two or three merger cases myself where we use some of the learning uh, from the merger guidelines. Uh, and we were, uh, the current guidelines reflect uh, uh, really an adjustment to um, the current technology, uh, two-sided platforms, uh, network effects um, that 
simply did not exist at the time of the, that the last uh, set of merger guidelines were passed. Thank you, Attorney General. Um, just briefly in closing, last year uh, you spoke on the subject and said that DOJ's enforcement against corporate crime has waxed and waned, but it's waxing again. That is news to my ears. Thank you so much for your service. I yield back. General, uh, Lady yields back. The gentleman from Texas is right.